Good evening. Welcome back to World War II TV. Was Rommel the desert fox or the desert flop? Was he the greatest commander of World War II or was he more, more Africa floor than Africa core? A panzer genius or a panzer dunce? To give us his learned opinion is Dr. Philip, Philip Blood. I worked on that introduction for quite some time, Phil. I hope you're impressed. I thought it was great. You got two thumbs. I'm trying to find where they fit. Cool. So thanks so, for bringing me in on this one. <laughs> you, you know the score. You're about, you're about the first person to volunteer for this when I had that wacky idea of myths and stuff. So you know the score. You've got 18, 19, maybe 20 minutes of so being generous to present your case. I'll bring the slides up. Folks, we may or may not have a couple, bit of time for questions at the end. Certainly we'll, uh, we'll you know, have a nice little chat in the sidebar. Tell me when to nudge on the slides, but over to you, um, Rommel, Dr. Phil Blood. Okay, so just to tell, just to inform everybody, uh, there's some caveats in this paper. I'm not doing the resistance movement, the military operations, or going through the war crimes, or or all the literature. This is purely uh, the two questions: Was Rommel the agent of his myth and his downfall, and has Rommel myth, has the Rommel myth become a tragedy for military history? And if I stumble, it's because uh, I'm a little bit fluey. But anyway, so. Let's get straight down to German command culture. And um, the word that you focus on with the German army is the Feldherr. And the Feldherr is the prize. For every German officer who wants to succeed, they want to become the Feldherr. And the most famous of them all was Moltke during the Franco-Prussian War. Um, but if we go back to 1940-41 when Rommel's on the rise, uh, he's not part of the top generals. And all of those generals in 1940-41, people like Keitel and Rundstedt, Kessering there, they're the guys at the, at the moment who are dominating the command culture of the German army. Now, if we very briefly go to the Feldherr, the, the, the terminology, I've used quotes and references from 1937 literature, so about the period where Rommel's making a name for himself, in terms of the Nazi party. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, I'm using it in the generic term, the master of the battlefield, but there's two points here um, that I think are important. First is to be the master of the battlefield and be recognized as such in the German army is to have a strategic victory like Malka in the Franco-Prussian War. And the other is political accountability and responsibility. These two things are very, very important points and they'll be you can see them develop later. So we move on. So here's Rommel's record as far as I can see it, and it's going to be fast. He's uh, a battalion commander, and he ends up in 1944 over in London. I'm not going to read for all the various commands. You can see them all. His political results are, and I'm looking at that from the point of view of how he would be evaluated in the command, his performances. Um, he's literally responsible for the destruction of the Africa Corps. Uh, Mussolini, uh, Mussolini's Italy is toppled, and Army Group B gets trashed. So if we just move on. So if we look at where R Rommel's uh, myth came from, it actually started a long, long time before the Second World War. And in this case, it comes from his time when he served in the Alpen Corps, which was this um, special corps of troops that were commanded by the chap with the Red Square, uh, Ritter von Epp. And you will see um, something very interesting in the Alpen Corps. Three senior field marshals came out of this group. One was Rommel himself, but also Paulus and Ferdinand Schoener. Now, none of them have performed greatly in that position, but to have three field marshals coming out of that group is significant. Now, when you look at another factor with um, Ritter von Epp, is his book um, about the way of the German soldier. And this writing and soldiering, it's very significant in German military um, traditions and culture. So if we just move on. So there's a longer Italian connection, which obviously goes to Rommel in the desert. Um, but you have to consider Ritter von Epp, who, who, who's gone from being um, this senior officer in the Alpen Corps to a godfather of Nazi militarism. And I took the picture there with, with him, with all the Italian officials in, uh, in 1938. And I cover this chapter, I'm sorry, it's shameless 
advertising, but I cover this in the first chapter of Hitler's Bandit Hunters, where I discuss security warfare, which is basically his colonial ideas, Ritter von Epp's colonial ideas, applied to the uh, security operations against uh, the Munich occupation by um, Bolshevik forces, um, which then later became part of German thinking about security. And of course, Rommel's first job for Hitler as a security officer for his um, escort battalion is very significant. That tells me in the threads that somewhere along the line, Ritter von Epp is playing more than just a simple role with um, Rommel. He's the man in grey suits who is giving advice to Hitler uh, on his capability. So if we move on. Now, the interesting thing about Rommel is the same as Guderian. They both produced these books in 1937. Um, what I look at, why I look at them, it's not just the parallel lives between these characters. It's their use of military doctrine as politics by other means. Now, obviously, I've twisted Clausewitz there. But the point is... They're publishing to be noticed. Uh, whether those whether those lectures are ever going to be actually put into practice, given that Rommel is talking about infantry tactics and then racing his tanks all over the desert, says to me that maybe what he's written is not going to be put into use when he becomes a panzer division commander. And similarly, um, Guderian goes on about all the his knowledge of panzer warfare and Frankly, you know, as Pritt said yesterday, I think he's a bit of a muppet, really. But anyway, that's me. So if we move on to the next one. So now here's the problem when you play with Nazis. Um, it's like when you lie down with dogs, you will get fleas. And in this matter, the biggest flea is Bormann. And what Rommel has done is literally placed himself in high vis to people like Bormann. And this will come back and haunt him later. So anyway, if we move on, uh, hubris. Rommel's period of um, fame covers the period 1939-40-42, and it's very interesting how he behaves in, the, in that period. He's very close to people like Goebbels. Goebbels is constantly mentioning in his diary um, how great Rommel is. And as you can see, when Rommel comes back he's very, from um, his last tour in Africa, he spends a lot of time with the, the Goebbels family, with the children. Um, you see him there. He's very quick to drop the Paul of Merit so he can get his knights and swords and crosses and, and whatever. And when he greets Hitler, there is um, an, a sense of warmth, which would tell you that the man does have a relationship with Hitler that's extraordinary. And there does seem to have been, if you look at some of the uh, letters to Lou and, and others, um, he's forever talking about Rommel, uh, Hitler, as being um, the future of Germany, the man who will bring us together. Now, what's obviously forgotten quite a lot, I'm not going to mention it in detail because I mentioned it as a caveat, but the 7th Panzer Division at this time made these huge moves in France, and they captured uh, many black colonial French soldiers, and this picture here shows um, a Luftwaffe officer, liaison officer for the division, uh, parading a black prisoner of war um, like a trophy. So there's always that line there, that problem um, in the history of Rommel. So if we move on a little bit. So his first strategic command, and I'm calling this a strategic command, is to go into Africa. And of course, the Africa Corps, is similar in some respects to the Alpen Corps and the Legion Condor, this idea of a small, highly mobile, highly efficient force that can go to a trouble spot, possibly even on the flank, as in the Spanish Civil War or the Alpen Corps in Italy, and sustain victories for the greater value of the of the um, of the nation. And in the case of um, Rommel, he's actually fighting for the Italian colonial empire to a certain extent. Although while he's out there, um, things are happening. And the most significant, and I put this here for the two, for one reason only, he's gone with his Mark III tanks, but in the background, the war is changing in Europe, in mainland Europe. And, you know, he gets a tiger or he gets a few, but really the, that tiger represents a change of German military doctrine in 42, 43. And he's not been part of that because he's not in the East. 
Okay, if we move on. So here's the thing about the Rommel myth. Sorry, can you go back one? I get an extra minute for that. That's my mulligan. <laughs> so it was my mistake. Yeah. Rommel myth in wartime. You know, we f we overlook the fact that he's got all this myth developing over time, and now he's created this image of himself, uh, the ghost division, the fox. Um, but if you look at Italians, and I, I've drawn here um, James Sadkovich's um, papers and work from the 1990s, you know, he picked up on Enrico Sierra, who was a historian and a member of the Ariata division, who called Rommel a liar. And it's very interesting that Kessering, before he left um, the war and became that nice man in the 1950s, was saying that Rommel, he was only as good as his nerves held out. And of course, similarly, um, Mussolini's um, empire was toppled as a consequence of the defeats in Africa. And that did not make him very popular um, because a significant chunk of military power that Hitler could rely on, like the Italian Navy, as we heard with Draken Falls the other night, um, was suddenly taken away from the Germans. Um, so if we move on. Um, so his second strategic command, uh, and I've loosely called it the politics of the Western theatre, and this is actually where my um, present writing is coming in, kicking in now. Um, he takes command with Rommel, Blaskowitz and Rundstedt in this so-called Hitler compromise. And now I put a red arrow because what's actually happened is although he's confronting the Allies with Army Group B, the real power in that triad is Rundstedt, and he will come back and haunt Rommel, quite literally. So if we move on. So here's, here's Rommel's nemesis. Um, he gets trashed by Monty, of all people, in Alamein, and then gets trashed again, and then eventually he loses the Africa Corps. And then just when he's looking like, you know, it's the end of his world uh, in his Africa Corps jacket, he's got sores around his face, he's repatriated home, his health is declining. Um, they, they rebuild him, they make him a new person. Okay, he does some stuff in Yugoslavia and other perhaps less honourable things, um, but he's put into condition, good condition, and then all of a sudden he's sent to fight on the Western Front, and lo and behold, Montgomery gets hold of him again, and that relentless attrition just literally wipes him away. Um, so if we move on next. Um, so we know about the, the resistance movement, his name's been put forward and all, and all the rest of it. What's interesting about the drumhead court martial, which takes place in September 1944, a couple of weeks before he's, he, he, he's given the choice of suicide or people's court, are the three people who decide on his career uh, and his future. One of them is uh, a guy called Kirchheim, who Rommel sacked in the desert. And now he's come back to haunt him. But here's the thing, and here's, the, here's a little story. Kirchheim served in the colonial wars with Ritter von Epp. So their relationship goes back to pre-First um, World War to 1900, um, when Ritter von Epp is cutting off Chinese people's heads and mounting them on poles. Kirchheim's there. And now he's been sacked by Rommel, only to come back into a court to decide on Rommel's future. And I would suggest... I'm not going to, I can't prove it, but that indicates that Ritter von Epp has withdrawn his patronage from Rommel. So Rommel now, ha, now has no longer any political capital. Now, of course, Bormann is the man who brings the evidence which slaughters Rommel, and then <laughs> his nemesis, <laughs> von uh, Gerd von Rundstedt, is also on the court. Now, OK, we know that Gaderian and all these other people are there, but I would say those three men are key because if they thought the evidence was shaky, um, they might well have just stopped it. But those three men made the decision and Rommel was done. What's very interesting, we move on to the next one. Uh, as the battles of the frontier start to emerge, 
Um, Goebbels, who was big on Rommel, has now moved to Modal. And as we're getting into the battle, you, you just look at the sequence. Goebbels is in, in Cologne as the Battle of Aachen is kicking off. Um, Rommel gets his suicide on, uh, offered suicide on the 14th of October. On the 18th of October, there is the funeral. And then the 21st of October, Arkan falls. And to be honest, that's the end of the story. He's a forgotten man. He's gone. And the whole of the Nazi machinery, the German army, the Wehrmacht moves on. And to be honest, Rommel then is a forgotten man. So if we move on to the next one. So we come to the post-war period and you would think, well, like all of what's happened in German military history, the period after a war, during the Napoleonic time, during the Franco-Prussian time, after the First World War, there's a period of publication and it's either triumphalism or lost cause. And the lost cause in the First World War saw um, men like Hindenburg and Ludendorff raised as Feldherr, who, given the opportunity, if it hadn't been for the Kaiser, um, we would have won and therefore we must do this again post-1945. And of course, if you look at the people who are putting forward Rundstedt, it's not him. He's too cranky, too old, too too miserable. Um, but Blumentrop and Westphal are writing about him. And he is being set up to be the Feldherr for the future. And if there is a German army, Rundstedt will be the man. Well, mm. if we go on to the next one, Along comes Churchill, who buggers up the plan, quite literally, and <laughs> and in pile all these other people like Little Hart, Rommel, films are made, uh, Runstead's trashed. And forever since, Runstead has been trashed. Now, whether he was a good officer or not, the fact is he becomes the one who's pushed aside because he's old and doddery and not very interesting, and Rommel is pushed forward. So we have the myth. Now, if we go on to the next one, when we get the myth, we say qui bono. Who benefits? And in this case, who benefited from the Rommel myth? And in my opinion, it's all these people. It's nothing to do with the Germans or the German society. No, nobody's really benefited. Okay, the Bundeswehr name a few barracks after him. But if you if you went through that cross of people, Little Hart, Churchill, Young, Corelli Barnett, somebody I don't recognize. Uh, John Mearsheimer and Schwarzkopf, they've all at some point said Rommel was this, that, and the other. Um, mm -hmm. Schwarzkopf, I recall, came to the City of London and gave us a great long lecture that his battles um, were as a consequence of either Hannibal or Rommel. Um, frankly, I thought it was a load of old tosh. Um, similarly with Little Hart. Little Hart would tell these stories about Rommel, but if you read some of his stuff, Rommel is always to the side and what, what I used to I mean here's an honest old opinion my family used to listen to Little Hart when he gave his talks back in the 60s and I sat there and wondered who he was and he the relatives afterwards was well we fought a hard war the Seventh Farmer Division did serious damage to this dude and what you got this snobby git saying that Rommel is the better soldier well you know that was totally unacceptable so uh, that's me. That's Rommel. And you can find this paper and all the subnotes and footnotes and everything else on my fallout substack.com page. Wow. Thank Tour you, guys. Um, yeah, and you did it in 20 minutes. I, I, I lost my bet with myself. <laughs> I don't know whether it's 20 minutes or 19.9. but 19 it, point something. But we've got a couple of questions there for you. Um, Ian Carr is saying, who would Dr. Blood have sent to Africa? If not Rommel, who would he, who would he have sent there? Um, funny enough, Bulk would have been a good one. I think he's kind of that sensible kind of general. I, of, of all the German generals, Bulk is one of those I think is quite capable. Um, I wouldn't have sent Rundstedt because he'd probably die in the, in the heat. Um, Kessering turns out to be a good one in Italy. Mm. Um, but I'm not sure whether he was that in 1941. You you really have to go back to 1941. Um, I don't know. It's a very good question, and it's worth 
considering. Um, but it certainly won't be Runstead. I don't think it'll be Lieb. Um, the, what was his name, beginning with a B, I've forgotten his name, the one who was Army Group Centre in 1941. He'd be a useful one. Uh, he was uh, quite good. Yeah, got his name. Some, some it's the there. pressure and the flu that's doing my brain in. Sorry. Well, yeah, if this is you on uh, on on a B performance, then I don't know what you on an A. Well, I do know what you like on an A performance because Bok is that who we're saying? That's the one. I think yeah. it was Bok. Yeah. So Norma Graham, this is a big one, and you've got like a minute to answer it. Norma Graham is saying, so was he in on the von Stauffenberg plot or not? And in on is a kind of a loaded question because there's being actively part of it, being aware of it, and vaguely knowing about it. Where where do you stand on this? Um, I think there's a case for suggesting he wasn't on the grounds that um, he had been Hitler's buddy. And even though Hitler is um, no longer, quote, his friend, um, I think Rommel isn't that stupid. I think um, he might have communicated with people um, dangerous words which possibly were picked up and, and we know that um Speidel and others picked up picked up some content from um, men being tortured uh, and it was put against Rommel but my view is no I don't think he was I think it's a story that is uh, created after the war I know that Manfred claimed that his father was deeper in the plot than he was in my opinion and that's only my opinion i don't think he was i think to the very end um rommel had politics his politics were to be with the fuhrer to play a relationship with the fuhrer and when that broke down there wasn't the time for him to suddenly become a major exponent of the resistance because if you look at the timings he's still until that moment when he gets into a, car, a staff car and drives around foolishly in Normandy, I think he's still of the opinion we can come up with something and the Fuhrer will will not need to be killed. Mm. That that story of him driving around Normandy, if that isn't a demonstration of hubris, uh, uh, I don't know what is. You know, everyone's saying, "Don't take a staff car, everybody," and he takes the staff car. You know, it's it's there's more to that than just you know the the practice. So if you interrogate the death. And you go back to that moment. I wonder if that's the moment when he went for honourable death, like death by cop. Mm. Um, I had thought about starting with that, but I thought that would be too much for people. Um, if you interrogate the death and you look at what happens, um, the, the Holocaust denialist refers to him being found sobbing in the back of the car, his hat off, um, slumped against the side. Um, that's not an image that even I, who... You know, some respect for the man here. He's made a horrible decision. He's made it easier for his family. I think that's a brave decision, and that shows Rommel's bravery. Uh, and, and that doesn't need to be taken away from it. But if you interrogate the death as an academic, and there is that element of regret, you're wondering well, what's going through his mind as per why did I get in touch with, why did I join up with the Nazis, or why didn't I join the resistance movement to make sure it would have happened? Those are possible thoughts going through your mind. But, um, yeah, a tragedy. It's no yeah. doubt a tragedy of a very brave man. Well, I think we will end it there, except to say that I think Rommel is one of the cases in these myth series where in some ways the jury is still out. There's, you know, you can't put him in a, any kind of single category. He's in that, you know, Churchill Montgomery category where you can't sum him up in a 140 character tweet. He is, there's a lot of nuance there and there's Rommel in 39, there's Rommel in 44. They're completely different people in many ways. And the transitional period, I like the fact that over the last few years, there has been more of an open discussion about him. People were very entrenched where he was a genius or he was terrible. I think people are allowing the, the, the idea of there being a mid position somewhere uh, to come in a bit now that he's neither a genius or an idiot. He's, he, you know, he veers towards both at times as so many commanders do. They, they kind of navigate this, this slalom between, um, you know, oh, look, he's doing so well and look, he's doing so badly. That's, that's human. We're all like that. I think when you lose two armies, there's no going back. Yeah. Um, and that's a real problem. Happy Christmas. Yeah, that's it. That's your tie there. We will leave it there, folks. I mean, what can you say? It's Dr. Philip Blood. It's been an absolute 
storming show. I will see you all again five minutes when we're talking about the myth of the Dad's Army Home Guard representation of the Defence of Britain in 1940. We'll see you all there. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, comments and questions. Thank you, Phil, for a fantastic uh, 20 minutes. And uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.